He's good. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We're going to be reading the whole first, the, the whole uh, chapter of first Peter chapter one. That microphone. I don't, I can't tell if it's loud or if it's loud. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We're going to read the whole chapter of first Peter chapter one. Y'all got echo back there? Yeah. Yeah. I hear echo. All right, here we go. Y'all ready? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, through, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen ye love, and whom though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister these things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, gird up your lo the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy, in all manner of conversation, or could be translated, in all manner of lifestyle. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons, judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation or lifestyle received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as, as grass, and all the grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers. The flower thereof falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Father, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, this morning that you would use me as a vessel, a mouthpiece to speak forth your truth. And we pray that your truth would minister to our hearts and bring hope, Lord, and bring freedom as you desire for it to do in each and every one of our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. You know, there's so much in this passage of scripture. It's kind of like the more I was reading it, the more I was realizing, you know, I knew that there was no way I could preach the whole chapter because it's really so rich and full of truth. And I really felt like I did an okay job of kind of like condensing it and trying to bring the synopsis of it. But one of the big, what I titled this morning's message, and I kind of played around with the title, but basically it was why worry about tomorrow when living today is so fun. <laughs> Just bear with me. You know, there's more to the story than meets the eye. Why worry about tomorrow when living today is just so doggone much fun? You know, tomorrow speaks of eternity in the title of my message. Not the uncertainty of tomorrow or next week. Not talking about your future and what, what, or the immediate future. The thought is, why would I be focused on eternity when today is so much fun or when today has me so distracted that I could care less about tomorrow? When I read this chapter again, even as I was reading it, I was thinking about some of the terminology that I didn't put in my message. But when he was talking about the salvation of your souls and he was talking about which things the prophets looked into, the prophets of old. You understand, Old Testament prophets, that the Holy Spirit moved upon them to speak forth and to prepare mankind for that which was coming. The Holy Spirit moved upon these prophets to foretell of the day whenever Jesus would come. It also said which things the angels desire to look into. I've explained it before many a times as I've preached, uh, talked about this passage, but... The idea there is that the angels are on the precipice of heaven and they're peering over. That's what it means in the Greek. They're looking over into this thing called salvation. And it's hard sometimes for us to wrap our mind around salvation. Sometimes we just take it for granted. But the angels of heaven don't take it for granted. I can tell you that right now. You and I might have a hard time wrapping our mind around really what it costs in order for mankind to be saved. No, really what it costs for you, for me to be saved. But I can tell you right now, the angels don't take it for granted, my friend. How do I know that? Because a third of their friends fell. A third of their friends rebelled against God and have no way back to God. And they monitored that. They visualized that with their celestial eyes, if we could say it that way. They were there. All of those angels were there in the presence of God. They beheld the glory of God with their celestial eyes. They knew how holy God was. They knew how powerful God was. Yet, even still, they made the choice that they made. There's no coming back for them. Right. See, for you and I, we believe by faith. Right. Even though we can't see Him, we believe in Him. Yeah. And there's something called grace that God has sent you and I as a gift through his son Jesus, amen, to redeem us, hallelujah. And the angels, they want to understand it better because they don't understand it. And, you know, really, I guess, once again, I kind of got caught up in thinking about all of that. But what I want you to know is, is this, is that he used words in this chapter like strangers in verse 1. Sojourning in verse 17. The, the meaning of these words describe a pilgrim and a traveler. So the overall idea is a stranger in a foreign land on a journey. The Bible is rife with this kind of information. You're a stranger to this earth. <clears throat> you were born the first time an earthling. You were born the first time of, from your mother's womb Born in sin, born like your father Adam, you were born an earthling, but I got to tell you that when you got born again, you changed your residence. Yes. Your residence now is that you have another inheritance, because yes. he also uses words like inheritance in verse 4, an inheritance that doesn't fade away in verse 4. But the word of the Lord endures forever, verse 25. Amen. So, But why worry about tomorrow when living for today is so much fun? So again, these words right here that I just listed off, inheritance fades not away, the word of the Lord endures forever. These words describe constancy, longevity, 
and eternity. But you know, it's really hard, right? I don't want to get ahead of myself, but when you when you the whole chapter is read together, it becomes obvious that believers have to be reminded. The preacher has to be reminded uh, that we are not of the world. That's right. Amen. This earth is not our home. Instead, we've become citizens of heaven, and that's where our true inheritance awaits. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. I mean, because if you don't, if we don't believe that, we're, I mean, I don't need to be rude, but we're really kind of wasting our time. Hello. That, let me tell you something. That's why most churches in America today, that's why most churches in the, what we call the modern church, they have a different message. Because that's why, listen to me, I'm just going to say it like it is. That's why Joel Osteen wrote the book, Your Best Life Now. Because that's what people want. Hello. People want to be happy now. I don't want to wait for tomorrow, preacher. I want you to tell me I can have my best life now. Now, we're going to get into some of that. Because God does have a plan to redeem you. God does have a plan to restore you. God has a plan to put joy in your heart. Yes. Amen. But it's a real joy. It's not a temporary joy. It's a piece of the inheritance that you have waiting for you that has been planted on the inside of you. But if you remain confused and you buy into the lie that's going on down here on this earth, you will, you will, today's going to just, you're going to be looking so hard for today to be fun that you're not even going to be worried about tomorrow. That's a problem, my friend. And if you got a preacher that'll that'll support that idea, if you got a preacher that'll build that idea up in you, that's a problem, my friend. Because we will we will pass our time here on earth, and we will miss the whole point that we were here for. And it happens all the time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But I can't see tomorrow. I'm here and today, and today things aren't so great. And I want to find a way to make them better and more tolerable. Imagine in your mind right now what you think would make you happy on earth. I mean, listen, I'm not asking you to do some, what we used to call it, psychology. Oh, Lord. Uh, huh? Visualization. Well, it's a visualization, but it's some type of imagery. Yeah, it's a visualization. I'm not trying to ask you to do that, but at the same time, I am asking you to do that. Like, in your mind, like, think about the things that you're like, okay, so I got this, this, and this, but if I had that. That one thing, you know, it's kind of interesting. I kind of, well, she's not here, but I was talking to somebody yesterday and well, it was somebody that Sierra used to go to school with and I don't really care if they watch, they'll, I doubt Sierra's going to watch my video, but I'm just trying to tell you a, a, a story. <laughs> There's a, somebody she went to school with. You know how like a lot of times people in life are trying to act like they got money and trying to act like they got, they all, all that, they all bougie like that. Well, look, so this, but this person that, well, she just walked in, praise God. This person that I was talking to with her about, she went to school with. These people have money, bro. You hear what I'm trying to say? Like, I've known people that got money, and I ain't never knew nobody that had money like this before, personally. I've been in some big old nice houses. I've ridden in some big old nice cars. But when I'm talking about money, I'm talking about money. And the closest I ever got to this kid was that I preached at a couple of chapel services. And then one time I was jogging down the road at home and come to find out he had some kind of horn that sounded like a train and he blew it right behind me. And I jumped and he laughed at Sierra. He said, your daddy jumped like a girl when I blew my horn at him. But we were talking yesterday about the fact that this boy, these people got so much money that this is the kind of money they got. Whenever they want to go fishing in South Africa, they tell the captain, take the boat to South Africa, let us know when you get there. And then they fly back home to Galliano, Louisiana, or wherever they from, and then they wait for the captain to get the boat to South Africa, then they jump on another plane just to go fishing for fish in the ocean where they are now. That's the kind of money these people got. Why am I even saying all that? Because I want you to imagine in your mind and in your heart what you think is going to bring you happiness and fulfillment that this earth has to offer. Whatever you've conjured up in your mind that said to you, if I could just have this on earth, I would finally be happy. Because I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, ain't none of that. Amen. Sword fishing in South Africa, the beach and in Bali, ain't none of that going to bring you fulfillment and happiness because your heart is sick for Jesus. 
And people can fish every ocean. They can be on almost every continent that there is to be on and have traveled the world and seen things that nobody else has seen and ain't none of that going to bring, going to fill that little hole in their heart. And they'll keep searching and they'll keep on looking. But I'm here to tell you, it's so simple to find because it's right there on the side of you and it's waiting to come in and it's waiting to bring fulfillment in your life. I can't see tomorrow because I'm in here today and things aren't so great and I want to find a way to make them better. You probably won't believe me, but whatever that thing was you imagined in your heart and in your mind, no matter how much of a good thing it may be, it will never in and of itself make you happy. As a matter of fact, if you look to that thing, whatever that thing may be, and again, it might even be a good thing. There's nothing wrong with fishing in South Africa. It may even be a God thing. But if you look to that thing and imagine in your mind that is what you need to finally arrive and once it does, you will finally be fulfilled and happy, sorry to say, you will be left with disappointment. Because if that thing isn't God himself, it's from this earth. And the things of this earth fade away. But our inheritance in heaven is eternal. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Look at this scripture right here. We're, read this with me. Matthew chapter 6. Verses 33 through 40, 34, I mean. This is a mindset. Amen? It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We're going to talk about that just for a moment. But it says right here, seek ye first. This is the words of Jesus. And this is what Jesus is telling you and I to do. Because if you go up above a few verses and you start reading, it talks about the Gentiles. You know what a Gentile is. Just bear with me here for a second. A Gentile, whenever we talk about Gentiles, it's people that don't know God. Right. Let's just understand that. Yes. I mean, yes, we're Gentiles, but we're Christian Gentiles. When the Bible was written, Gentiles were basically another word for heathen. There were people that had served false gods and they didn't know the one real God. Amen? Amen. So when he says, these are the things the Gentiles work with. Where am I going to get my food? Where am I going to get my clothes? Don't worry about that. Don't worry about the things that you need on earth. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things are going to be added unto you. He didn't say all your wants are going to be added unto you. He didn't say, oh, you're going to get a little jingle on the phone and old boy's going to call you up and say, hey, we're going to South Africa. You can come catch swordfish. But no, no, no. He didn't say that. He said all those things that you need will be added unto you. And sometimes you're going to get blessed beyond that. Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes you'll get blessed beyond that in so many ways that you never imagined. But when that's what you're searching for, when that's what you're hungry for, when that's what you're craving is the other things. The things to make today happen. Instead of understanding that there's a tomorrow to embrace. You're going you're gonna to endlessly run after something and you're going to stay empty. Hello. See, the, the tomorrow here. In that passage is different than the tomorrow in my title. The tomorrow in my title represents your eternal inheritance that awaits you in heaven. Whereas the tomorrow here is describing your future on earth and the concerns that are related with that future. The uncertainty of what's going to happen or how it's going to happen or when it's going to happen. I mean, listen, you can, you can have all that other stuff hemmed up, man. You can, oh, finally, I've, I've arrived financially. You got money in the bank. Got the, you got the truck paid off. Got the house. It's all set up. But listen to me. That is, there's a whole lot more to life than that. And you know, I'm not telling you something you don't know. Because every last one of us in here have concerns in our heart right now. Yes, amen, amen. What's going to happen with this? What's going to happen with that? But the Lord's promising you that if you and I will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that he will add these other things to us. We're going to talk a little bit more about what that means, but I'm not going to pretend at the same time that it's easy to focus on God and his will when we are living right here. You know, I don't, I'm a realist. I feel it. You see, because we feel down here. I've said it before. We're sensual creatures. We smell, we taste, we see, we feel, we hear. We feel loneliness. We feel physical pain, emotional pain. We have financial worries and we have things we want to do. But God promises that if we will concern ourselves with his business, then he will do his part in providing for our today. Yes. 
What he provides may not always be what we want. Right, right. But the sooner that we learn to accept his provision and quit trying to make our own, we will be able to enjoy the peace of God today. That's it. That, I don't need. I, we need, probably need to hang out there for a little while. I didn't even realize how good that was when I wrote it down. What he provides may not always be what we want, but the sooner we learn to accept his provision and quit trying to make our own, we will be able to enjoy the peace of God today. Yes. If you're sitting here today and you love God, but would admit in your heart that sometimes the things of the world seem funner, look better, more attractive because they seem cooler, you need to pray that God would open the eyes of your understanding. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Help me out here, church. I'm going to say it again because that was pretty good too. If you're sitting here today and you love God, but you would admit in your heart that sometimes the things of the world seem funner, look better, more attractive because they seem cooler. You need to pray that God would open the eyes of your understanding. You need Listen to me. When I first got saved, I did, look, we all got different backgrounds. Okay. But when I first got saved, I'm just being real with you. It's going to be silly. It's going to sound like a comic book, but it's kind of just reality. When I first got saved, something happened to me when I went up to the altar. I'm telling you right now, Jesus was birthed in my heart and in my life, and I was never the same. But for the next several years, I still thought Van Halen was cool. I still thought Eddie Van Halen on that screaming guitar and David Lee Roth doing a split up in the air was cool. I'm just using that as a comical reference. My point is, is that Eddie Van Halen did drugs and drank until his liver got hard and he killed him. Then he died. You know, the point is, is that David Lee Ross still trying to be a rock and roll star. And he's probably like 60 something years old. The, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that there ain't nothing really cool about any of that stuff because all of those people are living an empty life and they're striving and they're trying to find their piece of happiness on earth today. And what we need is a spiritual revelation to remind us that we're just pilgrims on this earth and that we're just on a journey and that there's an inheritance that awaits us in heaven. Amen. It's not to say that God's not going to give you any joy today. It's not going to say amen that he won't fulfill any of the desires of your heart today. Because I'm here to tell you that he will. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Can you put Ephesians 1.18 up there? Because, see, sometimes we just can't see. Amen? And what we need for God to do is to open up our spiritual eyes. Hello. Praise God. Hi. Look at this word right here. And I know I've, I've used this scripture a lot, but look. The eyes of your understanding. Did you know that your understanding has eyes? <laughs> what is my understanding anyway? Well, I would say my understanding is definitely very closely connected to my inner man. My spiritual man. That was brought to life when I got saved. But I'm walking around on this earth and if I'm thinking everything of the world is cool, my spiritual eyes, even though I love God, even though I could be saved, my spiritual eyes might still be closed. Right. And what I need the Holy Spirit to do, you know, listen, I don't even know why stuff, crazy stuff like this enters my head. But I was just thinking, you know, the big term in today's society is, are you woke? <laughs> woke to what? Come on, man. Really? Woke to what? Oh, gosh. <laughs> woke to the fact that, you know, Y'all been watching all that stuff that's going on in the world? The craziness out there? Come on, man. You're killing me. Woke to what? That, you know, that it's normal to be transgender? No. Cut me off of YouTube. I could care less. I'm never going to say that something that is absolutely ridiculous is okay. How does that even work? It's not normal. And when they say it's normal today, I guarantee you, if you looked in a textbook 15 years ago, it wasn't normal. See, God's the same today, yesterday, and forever. He doesn't change. His word doesn't change. The flower fades, the grass withers, but the word of the Lord, it will endure forever. And what God says was right before, hallelujah, is still right today. But the changing world that we live in, they're going to try to convince you. Right. No, what you and I need to get woke to is this. Yes, 
We need to get woke to the truth of the Word of God. We need our spiritual eyes of our inner man to be awakened and to be able to see. We need to no longer be spiritually blind. And listen, I can't do that for you. Oh, I can get up here and I can try to dissect it. I can try to explain it. I can even say it passionately. And like Robert says, you need to put a little... Robert's clowning me the other day at work. He said something I need to get a little... Oh, I think it had to do with maybe roof sales or something. He said, you're a little too passionate, man. You need to get a little bandana like Richard Simmons and hide those two. I was like, where do you come up with this Richard Simmons stuff? I guess he meant Richard Simmons is a little sweeter. I don't know what that was all about. But anyway, he wanted me to get a bandana and a hide them veins. I could say it passionately even to the point where the veins pop out in my hand. But what we really need is for the Holy Spirit to awaken our inner man to where he can see the truth of the gospel to where we can see there's a spiritual inheritance that awaits us in heaven. If, if, our, if our spiritual eyes aren't woke to the truth, we're going to keep searching for something else that's going to leave us empty. I hope it's making sense at least. See, all you can do right now is to say, I'm not woke. I mean, I'm talking about to the thing of God. I mean, I am not woke to what this man is talking about right now. Because my spirit ain't feeling it, my friend. There's like a blockade over my heart. There's like a hardened piece of ground that won't allow that seed to enter in. Because I'm not feeling I'm, I'm just talking to you like friend to friend. Like you know right now where you sitting in your chair, whether or not you have your spiritual life have been enlightened to what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, I believe it's true, but... I sure wish I was on that boat in South Africa right now catching a swordfish. What I'm trying to say is, is that you're the only one that can go to the Lord and to ask for that spiritual understanding to be enlightened. Can you put that verse back up there again? Because look what it says. See, see, Paul actually said this to them, to the church of Ephesus. My prayer for you is that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that they would be opened up. So that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. The Apostle Paul wanted the church of Ephesus and he wanted you and I to be able to see spiritually what the inheritance of the saints is. Because it's so hard down here. You think it's hard for you, my friend? Try being him. I'm talking about the man who wrote the letter. Try being him and stuck in a prison with shackles and still caring more about believers that he's going to write a letter to encourage them than to beg people to come take care of him. Uh-oh, now, oh yeah, now you went from, like Brad Bullock used to say, you went from preaching to meddling now. You done stepped on somebody's toes and poked a finger in somebody's eye. Well, the reality of it is, is, is this, is that many times we're living in so much selfishness that we can't even see. And we're still just wanting everything to be given to us. But the Apostle Paul shows us a picture in a man of what, the, what really happens when the kingdom of God comes alive on the inside of our heart. Amen. We become aware of the needs of others. We become concerned about the need. Why? Because there's a, there is truly an inheritance that awaits you. And the things that you do for the Lord today as you minister to other people, it matters for tomorrow. Amen? Amen. You need to pray. We need to pray and ask God so that we can see the kingdom of God and his righteousness for how it really is. All right. So here you go. You ready? We're going to talk about the righteousness of God real quick. In Romans 5, you don't really have to go there. You're just going to take my word for it. I went back this morning and I counted it this morning. In Romans 5, it describes the fact that the one offense of Adam, talking about the original sin of Adam, spread rampantly throughout the whole human race and that the result of sin is that all man is judged guilty. Then the gift came. Here, work with me. All man, because of Adam's one choice of offense, had sin that he was born with, but then the gift came. Oh, the gift was spoken of about all, by all those prophets for all those years before, but then the gift came. Hallelujah. Well, what was the gift? Well, if you read Romans 5, the word gift is used five times and it's implied once. 
And the gift is that God gave the world Jesus. Look at Romans 5, 17. Put that one up there. The God gave the world Jesus and gave the, and Jesus gave the world his life in exchange as payment for sin. And the gift of righteousness is given to those who believe. Look what it says in Romans 5 and 17. For if by one man's offense, talking about Adam, death reigned by one. In other words, because of the one mess up that Adam did, every last one of us in this room received a sinful nature from our father Adam, but much more they which did receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Listen, there's a problem that has plagued the human race, but I'm here to tell you, God has a gift. Hallelujah. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his Righteousness, And that's what we're talking about because, look, that's what the gift is. What is the gift? What is the gift? Say it. Say it out loud. It, it, it's Jesus, but it's the righteousness that he gave you. Without righteousness, you will not see the kingdom of God. And we ain't talking about your righteousness, brothers and sisters. We ain't talking about the preacher's righteousness because he ain't getting in on that. Because truth be told, it ain't really that good. But the righteousness of Jesus is always good. And it was given to you as a gift. Hallelujah. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. What we're talking about today is what? What was the title of my message? Why worry about tomorrow when living today is so much fun? We're so caught up in today's world, in today's society, in today's life, that we have forgotten that there's an eternal inheritance that awaits us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. That's what we're supposed to be focused on. Amen. But what did I say a second ago? Sometimes it's hard, man. Life hurts sometimes. It's painful. We got emotional turmoil going on, but Jesus will heal it. Jesus will heal it. But you know what our problem is? I'm, I'm telling you right now. I think about this all the time. Because <laughs> it's not just you. It's me too. You know what our problem is? When we find ourselves in the midst of emotional turmoil, when we find ourselves in the midst of physical pain, when we find ourselves in the midst of spiritual whatever, what do we do? We try to fix it some kind of way. You just imagine in your mind how you fix it. I don't need to sit there and poke at your stuff and scratch at your stuff to make it, <laughs> I was about to say to make it ooze, but that's kind of gross. I don't need to sit there and scratch on your stuff because I got my own stuff. But whatever it is that we keep trying to go to instead of surrendering and bowing the knee to Jesus, it ain't getting better, church. It ain't getting better. We just make it worse. You came here today to hear the truth. I'm here to tell you the truth. How do you know? Because I've done it. <laughs> and sometimes still do it. We ain't making nothing better, buddy. We're digging a deeper hole, digging a deeper hole. And then now we start to reach up there and we're starting to pull some of the dirt back on ourselves. Yeah. Help us. Help us, Lord. Amen? All right, so that was righteousness. That was one I wanted. But I want to talk to you a little bit about the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Look at Matthew 13, 44. I just picked two kingdom parables that were easy because they were right by each other and they were real short. There's multiple kingdom parables. What we're talking about again today is why worry about tomorrow when living today is so fun. No, it's a lie. <laughs> and we know it's a lie. And we're trying to talk about the fact that there's an eternal inheritance that awaits us and that we need to get our spiritual minds connected to that. Because if we could have our spiritual minds connected to that and the righteousness that we were given as a gift, we would function appropriately upon this earth as the children of God and as servants of God. Does that make sense? That's the word of God. Amen. Amen. But not like I already said once and I ain't picking on Joel Osteen this morning, but I don't even care right now. Your best life now. No. It's a lie. It's not, it's not really the word of God. And I'm not going to back off of it. It's not the word of God. All right. Matthew 13, 44. Look at this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hid in a field. The which when a man has found it, he hides it. And for joy thereof, he goes and he sells all that he has. And he buys that field. Now, first of all, it wasn't, it was hidden in the field. Okay, so you just imagine all the, how many people they say we got on earth today, 7 billion now or something like that? 
I don't keep track, but it's something like that, I think. <laughs> Seven billion people on the earth, and everybody's looking for something, right? We come, we, that's what we're, our message is about this morning. Why live, worry about tomorrow when living today is so, so much fun, and everybody's looking for something to make them happy, to bring fulfillment, to fill up the little empty spot, the piece of the puzzle that's missing, to stick it in there and to make it complete. And so they're all searching. It's not that easy to find. I mean, it's not like that big old statue. I remember Aaron took a picture. He went to Brazil one time of that big old statue and they got a Jesus over there. It'd be nice if it was that easy. Oh, look, there's the answer right there. No, it's not that easy. It's hidden in a field. The treasure of God, the kingdom of God is hidden, but it's easily exposed when the truth of the message is spoken and the heart responds by faith. Bing, there it is. So that's what happened. He was a traveler looking for the treasure, and there he found it. And what he did was he hid it up again. Now, it's not to hide it from the rest of the world, but it's like, man, i got to protect this. This is some important stuff. I want nobody to take this from me. So he hid it, and then what did he do? He sold everything he had so that he could buy that field, so that he could have that treasure that was in the ground. Hallelujah. Because there was nothing else that he had ever found that was more important than that treasure Hallelujah. that he just found. Yes. It's hard to be certain whether this man was diligently seeking for treasure or whether he just happened upon the treasure. Mm. Sometimes you might just, you don't even know where you would be. I mean, I'm sure there's stories before where people were struggling and looking. And some of you people were born in church. <laughs> I'm just saying, some of you were. I mean, I'm looking around, and if you weren't born in church, you've been in church ever since you were young. Your, little, your story is a little bit different than some other people's story. How, can you imagine the different ways that God has revealed himself to people? Don't, I don't know about you, but sometimes I just like asking. Whenever I find somebody that loves Jesus, I'm like, dude, tell me your story. Come on, come on, friend. Tell me. What happened to you? Because I am just so interested to know how you came to know Jesus. I'm telling you, if you'll start doing that, you will be amazed. God will reveal himself to people in so many different ways. So we don't really know. Was he searching diligently or did he just happen upon it? It's obvious that what he found is what his heart was looking for. He knew it without doubt. He realized when he saw its beauty and its value that there was nothing on earth that would ever, that he could ever find that would compare to this hidden treasure that he just saw. And so he hid it again. He hid it to protect it for himself. You know why? Because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. The enemy of your soul wants to steal the treasure of the gospel out of your heart. This is your personal piece of the kingdom of God. It's the Holy Spirit in you. And you can't let anyone take it from you. He rid himself of his previous possessions so that he could free himself up to have the field that contained the treasure. What are the things that you have accumulated in your life that are preventing you from gaining the one thing that matters most? That's for you and I to decide personally. That's for you. Listen to me. If you're around people, help me out here, somebody. Listen, I'm not trying to act like any of us in this room have already arrived. But if you think for one second, I'm going to go rub shoulders with somebody that I know is living knee deep in sin. And I'm thinking to myself that them people are going to let that, that infection spread on to me. L listen to me. I'm not perfect. You, you do understand that. I got my own issues. But, it, but I know places where I have been weak in the past. If I open up the door, if I turn on a spigot and allow an open door to take place, if I taste of a poison that I used to drink on a regular basis, I ain't dumb enough to realize that thing will overwhelm me. That thing will take back over me. The enemy will try to steal the peace of the kingdom of God that has been planted on the inside of me. I want to stay close to Jesus, and so therefore, I have to sometimes stay far away from other things. I'm not trying to tell you a system of words. 
But I can't stay away from it. Well, then you better cry out to the Lord that would understand that Jesus died on the cross and broke the power of sin according to Colossians 2, 14 and 15. That's worth writing down right there and studying. Colossians 2, 14 and 15 to understand that, the, that Jesus already died to give you victory over sin. No, it's a done deal, Christian. Whether you realize it or not, whether I understand it or not, Jesus has already defeated the principality and powers when he died on the cross and he said it is finished hallelujah now you and I got to surrender to the finished work of Christ yes. part of the problem is the free will that he gave us we don't want to surrender it we like it living for today is so much fun while we're here about tomorrow Lord help us alright that was the kingdom look at this the pearl Matthew 13 45 and 46 Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and he bought that one pearl. Here's another parable that goes along with seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The parable states that he was seeking. One of the meanings of that word is to crave. When you crave something, you're driven to go find it. He was driven to find the right pearl. No other pearl would do. Can you see him looking through piles of pearls? <laughs> I don't think you look at you one of them little things like you do a diamond, but I'm just, I see the big old pile of pearls and you're like, not that one, not that one, not that one. What do you do with a pearl? I don't know, you bite it <laughs> to try to find out whether it's legit or not. I don't know what you do with a pearl, but he, he was a secret. He was a per the merchant of pearls. He knows. He knows what's real and what's not. I used to think that, that oh, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> pearls are hard, dude. You don't want to bite them to a real pearl. It will chip your tooth. <laughs> he was driven to find the right pearl. Isn't this like so many of us driven, searching, always looking for something new to fill a void, to bring excitement? There's a couple of things about a pearl that I wanted to point out to you before we move on. A pearl is precious already. Amen. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is precious already. You can't manipulate a pearl. I mean, yeah, you can polish it. But a diamond, see, in order to really make a diamond look right, man has to put his, his hands on it, right? Got to cut away, make the little facets and make the, make the little angle so that the light will shimmer off of it, make it pretty. Got to build like a little place to stick it, right? With gold, man has to apply fire to it in order to refine it. To get all those impurities out. But a pearl is already precious. The hands of man can't manipulate it other than to polish it. In addition, a pearl is made. You know something else that's interesting about a pearl? Because you see, he was searching for a specific type. It was only one pearl was going to do. <clears throat> and finally, he found that pearl and nothing else was important to him. But one of the things in the past when I did some research on a pearl... You know, my understanding of how a pearl is created is that it has something to do with the underbelly of the oyster. The underside of the oyster, like a little piece of sand or something like that, will get up under there and it irritates it. It's almost like a little cut. And in a way, it's like almost like a scar tissue in a certain sense. But really what it is is that the oyster begins to secrete some type of a secretion. <laughs> That, that begins to try to heal this thing. And what happens is that over time from this irritation, it produces this lustrous calcification or whatever you want to call it, whatever a pearl is. So if you think about it, time and irritation help to produce something that was precious. And what I'm trying to say is, is this, is that many times in life, here we are, going through and we believe in God and we love God and we've accepted God into our heart, but we're having a hard time. Paul's prayer was that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. I want to see it, God. I want to be able to see the kingdom of God like other people see it, but I'm having a hard time seeing it. Just hold on, brothers and sisters, because like the irritations of life rubbing on the underside of your belly are going to cause the Holy Spirit to begin to move on you as you get tired, sick and tired of the things that have only left you empty, that have only irritated the underside of your belly. Sooner or later, the, the kingdom of God is going to be become much more precious, hallelujah, than what you would have ever imagined. I believe that. God knows how to get a hold of us. 
He knows how to get a hold of us and he knows how to convince us that what we're, you, we might not be there right now. I don't know who I'm talking to. You know better in your mind and in your heart exactly where you are. But you need to understand something. He's your God. Amen. You wouldn't be in this place this morning. I don't care where you've been. I'm here to tell you right now, he, you wouldn't be in this place right now if he wasn't the God that you love. And he knows how to get you. He knows what it takes to make that irritation on the underside of your belly. But I'm here to tell you at some point in time, we got to start surrendering to him. We got to quit thinking, oh, why would I want to worry about tomorrow when life to, living life today is so much fun? Boy, what a lie. What a lie. It ain't even that much fun. Even if you was on the deck of the boat with that old boy in South Africa, yeah, it's fun for a minute. But come on, dude, even after a while, that gets old. I got jet lag, man. I'm tired of flying all over the world. Trying to seek pleasure for myself. Dude, you ever flown on the other side of the world? I was 10 years old and turned 10 in Singapore. Let me tell you, you get tired. I wasn't right for three days after we landed in Hawaii. I'm just saying, it ain't all it's all cracked up to be. Thinking that, you know, that this is going to bring happiness and all that stuff. There's all, anyway, let me move on. One thing that I've learned about believers and myself is that it's not very likely that people will truly understand the beauty of God or the beauty of the kingdom of God quickly. No, our wandering hearts will have to search and look and try to find what we think we're looking for. But one day we will see it and realize there it is. No, really. The treasure was there the whole time. It was there the whole time. The pearl was there the whole time. It's just that the eyes weren't prepared to see its beauty quite yet. All right, now I'm going to start preaching my message. Y'all ready? Yes. You were born again as a citizen of heaven. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. He used those words. We're going to move quickly. He used the word foreknowledge. You know what that means? God prearranged this thing. Through sanctification of the spirit, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us. What I want you to know is that this plan of God was prearranged by God in advance. And some of those words that were used right there, sanctification of the spirit. Anybody want to take a jab at what sanctification literally means? It kind of got two meanings. One is holy, the other one is separated. When he, when he separated from what? You tell me. What, what, is this, what does the Holy Spirit in you separate you from? The world. Separate you from the world. What, what, is, the, what is the word um, e elect mean? Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. The word elect means chosen out. Chosen out of what? The world. God prearranged a plan where people that were born of Adam would be chosen out and separated out from the world. Don't think more highly of yourself than what you ought to, brothers and sisters. You're not all that in a bag of chips. The only thing that makes you different than the world is that the Holy Spirit lives in you. And if you got your head and your heart right, you want the Holy Spirit to live in the person on the side of you or the person at work or the person down the road. No matter how aggravating and irritating they're trying to create a pearl in your life. You want them to get a hold of the Lord. It's a prearranged plan of God that chose us out of the world, that separated us out of the world. How? Through the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Did you believe that this morning? That... And look what it says. He has begotten us. You know what that word begotten means? It means to literally to give birth. God has been, is giving birth to a family. And the way that he's giving birth to this family is through the blood of Jesus. And that when that story is told and people believe by faith, the Holy Spirit enters their heart, pulls them out of the world, and they become one with God. Jesus said in Luke 14, 26 through 28, Luke 14, 26 through 28, if any man comes to me and hates not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, I'm not, and yet his own life too. Don't focus on you got to hate your mom and your daddy. 
The point is, is this, is that anything, mama, daddy, brother, sister, get in your way of Jesus, that's a problem. Yes. Even your own life and the things that you want, Amen. if it gets in the way of you and Jesus, that's a problem. Amen. He cannot be my disciple. What is it that's been in your way? And whosoever does not bear his cross, let me tell you something, the cross is an instrument of death. And, and listen, I've, I'm not trying to promote this, but I've carried a cross around town before, and you can think whatever you want about it. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's, it, it's a little bit humbling. You know what I'm saying? I mean, whatever. I don't even want to get into all that because I don't have enough time for it. But what I'm trying to say is the cross is an instrument of death. When you carry the, the cross of Jesus Christ on the inside of you and you allow that to be known, I'm going to tell you right now, the world ain't going to always think you all that. He says, but you're going to carry your cross, bear your cross and come after me. He cannot be my disciple for which of you intending to build a tower sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he is, has sufficient to finish it. What, what is the main point I really wanted to talk to you about was counting the cost that when you entered into the kingdom of God and now the kingdom of God is in you. What is it? What does it look like to you if you go to school tomorrow and you vocally talk about Jesus? What, what do you imagine in your mind? How people are going to receive you. What do you imagine in your mind if you go to work tomorrow and you vocally represent Jesus? What do you imagine how the world is going to receive you? I'm just telling you what the words of Jesus say. It, that self has to die. Mama, daddy, brother, sister, if they're in the way, they got to move it out the way. Even your own self, if it's in the way, has to be moved out the way. Help us, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Will we build haphazardly without considering what it will cost financially or the amount of blood, sweat, and tears? Did you really believe unto salvation or was it just a good idea at the time? Now, now, now that's something for us to stop. I've used a lot of words already. <laughs> but just bear with me because it ain't even 11 o'clock yet. I'm about to get you out of here. I know. I called Wade up the other day. I'm like, dude, what you think? I went too long. <laughs> He's like, well, Matt, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, and I agree with Wade. And I don't know how long I've been preaching, but just give me three minutes. Five. Ten. All right? Ten. Ten. Amen. One. I trust some people to tell me the truth. Amen. <laughs> All right. Look, did you really believe unto salvation? Do you, when you look back at the day that you got saved, or you think you got saved, did you really Believe unto salvation. I don't know. It's not. I'm just asking the question for all of us. Amen. Because see, there, in this whole world that we live in, in this whole modern church, you would swear that all you had to do was raise your hand in vacation Bible school one time when you were nine years old and you're good to go. And all I'm trying to tell you is, is that when true salvation takes place and the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, you become the elect of God, the eclectos. It means you've been chosen out of the world. You've been sanctified by the Spirit. It means you've been separated from the world. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to start looking more like Jesus and less like your old man that was born of Adam. Amen. And so did you really believe in the salvation or was it just a good idea at the time? And now that things aren't going the way that you expected, there's a consideration to go backwards. Back to what you knew before. Back to whatever you thought would make you happy. Back to the things that are temporary. God's word says that if you're truly saved today, that you were born again through faith in the shed blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit moved into your heart, you were pulled out of the world, now you're a stranger on a journey, and that's why no matter what you buy or what you get, it doesn't bring lasting joy or happiness because it's of this world and you're not from here, this place is not your home, you're homesick, man, so do the work of God and he will give you grace for today, he will meet your needs for today. The point number two, sometimes today can be heavy. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. He says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Am I speaking to anybody this morning? Do you ever wake up and you feel like you're under the weight of heaviness? Because of the trials in your life. Because of the temptations that are going on in your life. Look what it says in verse 7. That the trial of your faith, which is much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Can I let you in on a little secret? 
Temptations are like trials that put somebody to the test. All temptations are not with sin. Many temptations are from sin. Like what? Oh my gosh, look at that pretty girl. Oh my gosh, that stuff makes me feel good. Oh my gosh, I need some more of that. So a lot of times temptations are that. But sometimes a temptation is just a trial, a test. The devil tested Jesus to see if Jesus would go outside the Father's will and fix things on his own. Many times the tests of life are we're going to trust God to get us out of this predicament or to lead and guide us in the right way versus I'm about to fix this thing. <laughs> I mean, that's good stuff right there, what I just told you. Because it's the Word of God. It's the, idea, it's the mind of God. What are you going to do, son? Are you going to fix it yourself? Or are you going to let me work in you and through you? Because listen, though you might find yourself in heaviness for a period of time, you need to understand God's working in you. He's refining your faith. He's putting the fire to your faith. He's removing the impurities. Listen, whenever a refiner puts fire to the gold, the impurities are revealed. Many times God allows trials in our life to reveal the impurities in our life so that we'll recognize it and we'll say, Lord, take it. Hallelujah. Refine me. Oh, yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. I was, I was thinking about this. The same, whenever he applies that fire, it's like being in a fiery furnace. I was thinking about them three Hebrew boys. Oh. Maybe the musicians could go ahead and come to the front because we're going to walk out of here worshiping the Lord. And you know what? When we start worshiping the Lord, I mean this when I say it. I don't mean it cocky or condescending. If you have to go, I understand. You know, I done kept you here a good little bit. But we're going to worship the Lord. And I don't know how we're going to long we're going to worship the Lord, but we're going to worship the Lord till we don't feel like worshiping the Lord no more. <laughs> might be five minutes, might be ten. Who knows what the Lord will do. Okay, but what I'm trying to say is this. I'm just getting you prepared for the end. Amen, <laughs> you ready? That them three Hebrew boys, you know, I went back and I read that story this morning. Y'all remember that story? It was, it was Babylon, it was King Nebuchadnezzar. What did he do? He prepared an image. And you know what that image was? If you go back and you look at that image, it was made out of gold. And it had a bunch of sixes connected to it. Six cubits here, 66 score and all this kind of stuff. And when I see that image, man, I'm thinking to myself, that's the image of the beast. That's an Old Testament type of what's to come regarding the image of the beast. How do you know? Because he said, when that image comes down the road and you hear the music, you got one choice. You bow down to that image and you give it worship. I'm telling you right now in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, the enemy, the Antichrist, is going to try to make everybody worship him. And you know what them three Hebrew boys said? They were in the midst of a trial, a fiery trial. And he said, we're not going to bow. Oh, you can throw us up in there. But the Lord will deliver us. And if he does, we're still not going to bow. And you know what happened? Whenever they threw them in that trial, it said that there was a fourth one in there. He looked as though he were the son of man. What I'm here to tell you is you might be in the midst of a trial this morning. You might be going through temptations, through trials. I'm here to tell you, though, Jesus is right there with you. He's right there with you every step of the way. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. Amen. Put your hope and your trust in him and understand that he's working on your faith. So that when Jesus does return, you will be prepared. I will be prepared to receive him. This is the last thing I wanted you to see. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 through 25. All flesh is as grass. All the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. I want to remind you, your life on earth is as temporary as the greenness of grass. I was walking through some yards yesterday. It was just the easiest path. Walking through yards and all the grass was brown. It was crunching under my feet. And I was thinking when I thought about this, grass doesn't stay green. The beauty of a flower fades. Our physical bodies in this world that we live in are fading as we speak. But one thing is certain. 
the word of God endures forever. This gospel we preach endures forever. Your eternal reward endures forever. So I don't know what you got to do. I don't know what I need to do to convince myself that my title is a lie. Why worry about tomorrow when living today is so much fun? Because it ain't true. There's an eternity and an inheritance that awaits us. Hallelujah. Let's worship the King. And I want you to know if you need prayer, the altars are open. Amen. Hallelujah.